Um, I'm Lisa. I'm the Director of Events and Programs at Center State CEO, so thank you for being here today. Um, I first want to um, thank everybody that's been in this group. Um, it's been a, a couple months of work for all of us, so thank you to Nan, especially with the United Way, um, for bringing this um, topic to us. Um, it's, we know it's important right now. Um, we know that many um, employees, employers are also struggling with this, so um, it's great to be able to get everyone in a room to discuss this. So, so so today, let's start with um, how we're gonna start off the day. I'm gonna let um, Louise actually um, do an agenda in a little bit so he can let you know how the day is gonna go. But um, we have a great panel of experts today um, that are gonna teach us some techniques and how to make tomorrow or even today a better day. So um, let's start by giving um, the mic right over to Nan so she can say a few words and then we will start the program. Good morning. Thank you, Lisa, and thanks for all the work you've been doing. So we're really glad you're with us today. I think, you know, this is a time of year when we all sort of perhaps pause to think about the year and hopefully find many things to feel thankful for. And yet it's also a tough time. And we know that we ourselves and many loved ones and colleagues um, are really going through stresses of so many kinds and uh, perhaps feeling a little bit um, exhausted by it all. I know that there's still way too much stigma around seeking help for mental health supports. I don't think anyone hesitates to go to the doctor if you have a physical concern. And yet so many of us still struggle with that. Do I, do I say I need that kind of help and somehow see that as a weakness? Well, I will tell you that I personally have benefited from counseling at times in my life when I've been facing situations that I needed some extra support and I needed to talk to someone who wasn't a loved one, right? Because sometimes you need help from someone who isn't so emotionally connected to you. And frankly, you can say things to that person that won't be with you for the rest of your life like someone in your family is. So we are delighted to do this uh, session today our third in this first series together, where we're talking about these issues and helping each of us think through um, things we can each do. So we can't change who your supervisor is. We can't change your work hours. We can't change how much money's in your bank account. We wish we could, but there are many things we can do together. So that's what today is, or I should say, there are things we can do individually and uh, to benefit ourselves. And self-care isn't selfish. Self-care is smart because we can't take care of other people if we're not taking care of ourselves. So I'm delighted to introduce the person who will shepherd us through the rest of the program, Louis Escobosa. I'm delighted to say as a colleague here at United Way, he is our chief impact officer. He cultivates relationships with local stakeholders, oversees our strategic community initiative investments, and he helps us create better processes and systems that really optimize the community's investments. We're really proud to put back into the community to keep that system of human services going. Lewis, uh, prior to being with us, was helping Onondaga County think about the way it invested in human services. And he's a graduate of the State University of New York at Oswego, has his master's in public administration from Syracuse University. And I'm delighted to turn the program over to Luis Escobosa. Great, thank you for that great introduction, Nan. And I'm, I'm so uh, thrilled to, to be here today and really uh, guide us through this really important conversation that we're about to have about you know mental health, stress, burnout, and all of the things that um, we're able to do to really um, improve our own mental wellness. Um, as we you know, live our lives each and every single day. Um, so to give you an idea of the program format today, we'll have a, a presentation by Dr. Tom Schwartz about mindfulness and brainfulness. And that presentation will focus on stress, um, burnout, mindfulness, brainfulness. And then we'll dive into our um, distinguished panelists, which I'll introduce one by one. And they'll each deliver um, their own set of presentations to really equip the audience, all of us here today, with skills, tools, and resources that we can implement and utilize in our own day-to-day -day so that we can have better mental wellness, um, improve our own mental health outcomes, and just be better, um, feel better um, individually 
um, each and every single day. We'll also have interactive questions embedded throughout. And before we actually um, start, and before I even introduce Dr. Uh, Tom Schwartz, I'll, I'll allow you to interact with one of those questions now and I'll share my screen so that we can really um, start the, the session off right. So if you go to the chat, you'll see a Menti link and I'll share my screen. And the first question is really, where in your body do you feel stress? When you are at work and things are bogging you down or you're at home and you're dealing with some stuff, where in your body do you feel stress? That is the question. So you're allowed to think about, is it your shoulders, is it your head? Um, do you feel tension anywhere? Um, so I'll share my screen in a second so that you can see the responses come in. Okay, great. So some great feedback there um, that I hope uh, Dr. Tom will use to inform his presentation. So without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Tom Schwartz. He is currently a professor and chair of psychiatry at SUNY Upstate Medical University. Dr. Schwartz is active on many teaching, administrative, and academic oriented committees at SUNY. He also provides direct supervision, lectures, and several courses with resident medical physician assistants and nurse practitioner students. He directs and organizes continuing medical education events for the psychiatry department as well. In addition to that, Dr. Schwartz received his medical degree from, from and completed his residency in adult psychiatry at the State University of New York, Upstate Medical University in Syracuse, New York. So without a doubt, he is an expert um, on the subject matter at hand today, and we are thrilled to have him. And thank you, Tom, for sharing your time with us. We're thrilled to hear what you have to say. So um, let's see, I guess a couple of things. One would be to, I don't know, what are my goals? My, my goal here would be to suggest, um, I'm told by patients, uh, family, friends, you know, people in the workplace sometimes, and, and as Nan hinted, you know, sometimes talking about stuff is important, not necessarily with family members, uh, maybe you need, somebody professional, maybe you need to talk to a clergy member, maybe you want to talk to an employer, manager, supervisor. So I also get met with, there's no way talking helps. There's no way thinking through things help. Thinking is not going to change my awful day. Um, it's all psychobabble. Um, so I don't know if any of you have heard those stigma kind of things, those stereotypes, but it does get in the way of people uh, seeking help. The other thing sometimes we'll see is employers, you know, I don't want to pay for wellness, I don't want to pay for mindfulness training, I don't want to give people breaks, and there are some mean employers, let's say, or supervisors. But um, one of the last talks we gave, Dr. Ron Fish did a real simple, you know, one or two minute mindfulness exercise, and, and the point of this talk is, if you do things like this, whatever angle you're coming from, your brain changes, psychobabble, counseling, mindfulness things, talking to nice, caring people actually changes what your brain does. So that's the goal uh, of this talk here. So I need to start off by talking about stress. Um, you mentioned in, in the word cloud, we just saw many of you, stress can create mental anxiety, worrying, ruminating, obsessing, and physical anxiety, right? You feel the tension in all those body parts that, that you mentioned. One thing to remember is low levels of stress are good, right? So if you have low levels of stress, hey, you know, if I don't get up with the alarm clock, go to work, uh, be nice to people I'm working with, uh, put dollars in my pocket, food on the table, right? So a little bit of stress is good. It, it motivates us to go do things. Why? Because we want the stress to go away. I go work an eight to 10 hour day. I know I'm getting paid and whew, I'm going to be able to put food on the table tonight, pay the rent. Um, so a little bit of stress is good. Too much stress is awful. You feel awful. You feel it in your neck, your back. You worry too much. You're unfocused. You're distractible. Your productivity at work actually goes down. You're irritable at home and your brain suffers. So, right, your psyche is bothered, right? Psychologically, you, you know you're hurting. But I want to show you here in a second how the brain isn't working well either. This is just a real quick curve. Uh, and what you'll see on the bottom is uh, arousal or anxiety. And as you go from the left to the right, you have low anxiety to high anxiety. And on the, the upward axis is performance. 
And what you'll notice is low levels of anxiety, performance improves, whether it's me giving a talk today, people making widgets on an assembly line. Um, so anxiety, I want you to view anxiety as good to a certain degree, and then you fall off the curve. And if your anxiety gets too overwhelming, your brain frankly gets overwhelmed, doesn't function right, and you make more and more mistakes. So here's a fancy picture of, of some brains on stress. If I can prove to you, this is not a neuroscience talk, please don't have your eyes glaze over. Um, but look at all these cool colors in the brain. Well, those colors aren't cool. That's showing where you excessively anxious and stressed brains are operating differently from normal. Your brain is a bunch of electrical firings and networks and circuitry. They like to fire in a certain way to be optimal. But when you get too stressed, too anxious for whatever reason, the brain doesn't fire in an optimal way. It becomes very inefficient. And when people are stressed and anxious, they don't focus, they don't concentrate, they don't control their emotions well. The brain is abnormal when, when people are on stress. Here's a, a little bit of a cartoon. Uh, what you'll see at the top is a, uh, a really nice brain nerve or neuron, nice kind of bushy looking plant-like almost. And if you scroll down the right under ideal levels of stress in nurturing and caring and you know, having a well-rounded day, let's say, there's kind of fertilizer in, in your neurons, your nerves stay bushy and healthy and happy. Look on the left. What if you go to work every day and get crushed, right? Hopefully you're not getting crushed by your boss, or your supervisor. Maybe it's extra work. It's mandated shifts. Maybe it's stress in your life at home that you bring into work. I, but when you're super stressed, notice how the neurons, the nerves shrink a little bit. They're not connected to each other. So uh, that's what happens when you're stressed. A hormone goes up called cortisol and it kind of gets rid of your brain fertilizer and nerves shrink and then they don't talk. And then that brain lights up with all those pretty colors, which are the wrong colors. And so that's what happens under repeated and recurring stress when you're kind of falling off that curve. So are these things touchy feely? Some of the mindfulness exercises, and you're gonna hear some of them today. And some people believe you're going, that's corny, it'll never work. It works for the brain now. You can think whatever you want. The brain changes with some of these exercises and they, they don't take two, three, four hours a day to do. So uh, again, don't have to memorize this uh, scientific stuff, but here's a study that I'll share with you. And on the left, there's a group of people that were taught simple mindfulness techniques. You're gonna see some of them today. On the right side is a group that got no training. And we put them in a fancy brain scanner called a functional MRI. And we, we pipe in different images that they see, pleasant images, unpleasant ones, neutral ones, scary ones, ambiguous ones. And all you do is watch the brain react to images, right? You know, you see a, a soft, fluffy bunny and you go, huh, how cute. Your, that's, your brain's doing that to you. You feel it psychologically, right? Uh, you see a picture of a funeral and your, sh your shoulders go down and you get sad. So images are very powerful at provoking the brain to react. So what did we find? Uh, what did this, this group of researchers find? If you get simple mindfulness training, right? and you go through a whole series of pictures, when the unpleasant ones come up, your brain doesn't react as bad. You get through a tough experience without your brain going haywire and getting stressed. So we know mindfulness changes the way you view the environment, how you view the threats in your environment. Um, it gives your brain a break from firing in the wrong directions. It resets your brain to be calmer and fire less electrically. And, and so simple training, like some of the things you're gonna see today makes your brain more efficient, less scared, less in fight or flight. And again, fancy images on the bottom of the screen. I, I just thought it would be easier to show you an image like this. So uh, here's a person's brain. And what you see in the front part of the brain is a big blue oval. Blue means cold or underactive, sluggish. The neurons aren't plugging away and firing electricity. Notice the big red dot in the middle. That's your amygdala. That's your fight or flight center. That's the part of your brain that's looking for threats. So people under too much stress in the workplace or wherever, um, the fight or flight center is going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, all day long. And that's how the brain is abnormal. It's unfocused. Um, it's inefficient. It's burning too much calories looking for threats. 
if you do, and then the front part of the brain is cold or underactive, it can't control the, the fight or flight sensation, right? So there's an imbalance. Front part of the brain is weak, middle part of the brain is too strong. And then what happens with mindfulness training in other forms of psychotherapy? I don't know if you saw that switch, right? Front part of the brain is cold, now it's hot, it's red. You're strengthening, it's like weightlifting for the front part of your brain. The front part of your brain gains control. It, it thinks th through things better. It calms the fight or flight center. Notice the red amygdala in the middle. It's not red anymore. It's calmed down. You've restored the balance. And then your brain functions better. It doesn't burn as many calories. And you do get through your day better for doing some simple things. So think of the brain as always having a dance, right? The front part of your brain is trying to calm things down. The middle part of the brain is, oh my gosh, things are awful. And it's a dance that goes on and off all day. But under chronic stress, what happens? The front part of the brain turns off and the middle part, the fight or flight just wins every day. You wake up and it's turned on. Um, so on that level, if your day's going poorly at work or at home, can you take a few minutes? Do some mindfulness exercises, reset the brain, get the dancing partners in sync, the front and the middle part of your brain. So uh, doing some of these things, um, I, I believe in the heart, mind, and the soul, in the psyche, and the spirit, but doing some of these talking and thinking things changes the way your brain fires. It changes your brain chemistry and electricity. So I will leave it with that and turn it back over to, to Lewis. So the, these are good things. Uh, they help people. Um, and even though they take a few minutes sometimes, uh, very helpful things to do and, and take a break from the rush of stress that we all probably feel every day. Thank you, Tom, for that really insightful talk about stress and really the, the science behind how our brain is processing all of these stimuli each and every single day. Um, but let's get to the good part, right? We get it, stress, it's, it's part of life. What can we do about it? So today we have with us Allison Kuhn. Allison Kuhn is the project director for the Emergency Response for Suicide Prevention Grant at Contact Community Services. Allison received her Master's in Arts in Mental Health Counseling from Medeo College in August of 2021 and is currently working toward licensure. Allison is a certified applied suicide intervention skills trainer and has four years of experience with crisis intervention through many different mediums, including telephone and text-based and other mental health evidence-based practices. So today she'll um, provide us with some insight, you know, as to how we can start our day, how we can set some goals to really breed mental wellness and mindfulness um, so that we can have a, a better day and improve our own mental health outcomes. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Allison. Thank you for being here today. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking a little bit about how to make tomorrow a better day. Um, stemming off of what Dr. Schwartz talked about is, you know, we can incorporate mindfulness at any point in our day, but there's also other things that we're capable of doing to make the day that we're in better, to prepare for the following day, to make it a little bit smoother. So we're going to talk a little bit about those different things today. So starting your day, um, I really like the quote, make each day your masterpiece, because I do believe that we are in control of our days. Um, you know, starting the day off right sets the tone for the rest of your waking hours. Um, however, it's important to note and just like Dr. Schwartz had mentioned, is that self-care is, it's incredibly different for everyone. Um, the right way of starting your day may look different for everyone based on, you know, their career, their responsibilities that they have in a day. Um, you know, self-care in any form is really not linear. So take a moment and think about the way you start your day. How does your routine and daily rituals impact you? What might you be able to do differently? Um, you know, I think to myself, starting my day off right looks like doing light exercise in the morning, having my cup of coffee, and starting it off slow. I don't like, you know, jumping out of bed, getting ready, and then rushing right to work. That's not something that works for me. But maybe that extra sleep in the morning, you know, starts your day off right for you. So just think about that throughout this PowerPoint. Think about 
what your routine looks like, maybe some things you can implement into that routine, some things you can change, or maybe you like your routine. You know, it's all up to you. So the next few slides will just cover different things you can do to prepare for a better day and to start off your morning, you know, on the right foot, whatever that looks like for you. Okay, so tips for a good morning. Um, you know, give yourself some you time. Mornings can be really, really stressful and rushed. And to avoid this, sometimes all you need is an extra 10 minutes in the morning. You know, whether this is waking up 10 minutes earlier, leaving 10 minutes early for your destination, you know, allow that extra time to relax and recharge. Um, you know, we don't want the brain feeling like it's rushed and that triggers that anxiety response. And then, you know, most likely the rest of your day will feel very rushed. Um, and again, it's that fight or flight response where you'll feel like you have to, you know, continuously be doing something or act on that response. So just a tip, no one likes to wake up before they have to. Um, if you have trouble getting out of bed, turn a light on as soon as you wake up. Um, light is what controls our sleep and wake cycle. So, you know, instead of leaving the light off, playing on social media, you know, texting people back, responding to emails, just flip your light on, maybe read for a couple of minutes, or just gather your thoughts for the day. Allow your mind to wake up and your brain to wake up in a, you know, kind of slower manner, not rushed. Give yourself that time. Another thing you might be able to do, which, you know, I'm sure you've all heard of is eat a healthy breakfast. You know, breakfast really is one of the most important meals of the day. Um, ensuring you get that balanced meal in at the start of your day helps fuel your body. Um, and that alone will help improve energy and concentration. Um, you know, eating breakfast, they say that you'll feel less sluggish because you have that nutrition in your body. Um, so just doing that in the morning is a simple thing that you can do um, to start off on the right foot. So preparing for a good day. It doesn't all have to be done the, the same day. You can start preparing for a good day actually the day before. Um, so what might that look like? You know, getting a good night's sleep. Adults require seven to nine hours of sleep each night. And without that adequate amount of sleep, you may feel really sluggish as the day progresses. Um, so, you know, other things that you can do in the morning is write a list for the following day of things that maybe you need to accomplish in your day. Have a good idea going into the next day so you know what to expect and nothing comes as a surprise, which can also trigger that, you know, fight or flight response. Um, you know, you could also remind yourself that you don't have to continue thinking about it by writing it down. Um, I have my own clients and I find that it is super helpful to encourage them to keep a journal, keep a notepad, write down your responsibilities for the following day so you can get that out of your mind and let it go for that day. It's not happening yet. You don't have to necessarily stress about it until it happens. Um, so it's kind of like that cognitive behavioral, um, technique of, you know, worry time. I'm going to worry about it when it comes, but for now I'm going to write it down and forget about it. Um, another thing that you can do is to give yourself an hour before you actually want to fall asleep to watch TV or scroll on social media. So having that buffer will allow your brain some time to shut down before you try and fall asleep, making for a more peaceful rest. Um, I know if I scroll on social media or I'm trying to watch like a really intense show right before bed, my mind is not allowing me to go to sleep. I am going to sit there for, you know, 45 minutes to an hour thinking about what I just read, what I was just watching. So giving yourself that buffer will allow your brain to shut down. It'll allow you to actually be able to experience that rest and relaxation so you can fall asleep at a more, um, you know, natural level. Something else that you might be able to do to prepare for a good following day is to establish an evening before routine. Um, so some healthy habits may include preparing your day the night before. So packing your bag, packing your child's backpack, making lunches ahead of time, laying out any outfits that you'd like to wear the next day, 
putting your keys slash wallet, you know, somewhere where you can remember where those are. So it's not, you know, a mad dash in the morning trying to locate everything. Um, simple things like that can make for a less stressful morning, um, which again, less stress, you go into the rest of your day just at a more natural state. So creating goals. So we know a couple of things that we can do to make our days just well-rounded, go smooth, make them a little more, um, you know, easy going for us, less anxiety. Um, but something else we can do is creating goals. So a good day is made up of several small tasks, eventually getting closer to larger goals every day. So these goals may look like completing a part of a larger project, sitting in on a certain number of meetings, making a select number of calls, whatever that might be for you. And these small goals show progress. You know, oftentimes we kind of get into our heads and we're like, what is the end goal here? What am I working towards? But every day, the small things that we do, they're eventually going to amount to something that we've been working towards. So daily goals allow for, for control and prioritization of your day. So try to write them down in advance, even at the end of the previous workday. You know, go into the day knowing what you hope to accomplish. You can also use goals as guides, but remember they're not rules for yourselves. Goals are meant to push you in the right direction and may not always dictate where you will end up. Your best is enough. Um, oftentimes we, especially for those who are super goal oriented in nature, we sometimes get stuck in that mindset of guides are, or rules are not necessarily guides, but they're hard and fast rules that we have to follow. That's not always the case. That alone can create a lot of pressure and stress. Um, so use them as guides, not necessarily rules, and allow those goals to be flexible as you progress. Um, something you may look to do is to set approximately three goals for yourself and make them SMART. So the acronym SMART is Specific, Measurable, Achievable, Relevant, and Time-Bound Goals. So they're clearly defined objectives that are realistic to achieve in a day. Um, sometimes when we try to set goals for ourselves that are realistically just too big, that can lead us to feel very overwhelmed. So making them more concise, you know, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound, they're a little bit more, I guess, for lack of better words, less anxiety-provoking to look at. So goal setting with intention. So goals and intentions are a little bit different. So starting your day with an intention is deciding on an area that you wish to focus your energy on on that particular day. So this can help you stay focused on your needs, like your mental health. So intentions are grounded in reality in the present, much different than goals, which are projections into the future. So like we had just saw, basically goals are what we're hoping to achieve, where intentions are short term and they're based in the reality in the present. So before we move on to some examples of intentions, Think about what your intentions are. And you can reference the picture on the screen. You know, a conscious intention leads to choices, which leads to an intended outcome. You can think of these like affirmations, um, something you can say to yourself that serves as a source of motivation and personal accountability. Um, you know, affirmations, some ones that you might be aware of are, I am enough. I am doing the best I can things that allow you to stay motivated and allow for a sense of accountability throughout your day. So some daily intention examples, um, you know, I will be more present and live in the moment. I will listen to my intuition and let it guide me. I will make my work environment more positive. I will be intentional with my time. I will make time for things that are important to me. I will remember that I am enough. And I will remind myself that productivity does not equate to self-worth. Sometimes starting your day, ending your day, really at any time you need to give yourself that reminder that you are doing the best you can, whether it's in your personal life, your um, you know, academic life, your career, any you know, environment where you feel like you just need that reminder. These are simple things that you can say to yourself at any time. 
Um, you can write them down. I know that sometimes putting sticky notes up where you are present the most in a day. So maybe at your desk, um, on your bathroom mirror, on a mirror at your house, anything that works for you, you can use these as reminders for yourself. So just to kind of conclude what we've talked about, starting your day off right starts with you, you know, and including these simple things into your routine will allow for a smoother day to transition, um, improving your mental health along the way. So it's not magic. You know, these are things that you do have to kind of set in place yourself and you have to find that motivation to um, just like the mindfulness, you have to put them into action. Um, but it's also not impossible. So start here. What is one thing from this presentation that you might be able to take with you to improve your day? And that is it. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Allison, for those great tips. And we hope that you are incorporating those too. And we're actually curious. So again, go over to our Mentimeter link and we have a, a quick question, right? Are you currently incorporating mindfulness and mental wellness activities into your daily routine? We're really curious because we really feel that these sorts of activities, which are really simple um, and easy to implement, can make a huge impact. All right, so just about half, five and five um, so far. Well, while you guys are all working on the poll, um, I have the, the privilege of introducing our next um, panelist, Rochelle Lando. Um, she received her master's degree from John F. Kennedy University in the Bay Area. Rochelle has worked at St. Joseph's Health for 13 years. Her current role of eight years has been building a healing arts program and optimizing the languages services program. In the healing arts program, she developed six programs, including healing touch, therapy pets, aromatherapy, music therapy, music and memory, and therapeutic music. In addition, Rochelle teaches self-care and stress management classes to graduate nurses. She is the coordinator of the colleague care team that was instituted at the beginning of the pandemic to ensure all colleagues feel supported during everyday stressors and the continual transformation of healthcare. So certainly an expert when it comes to um, rooting out stress really and, and dealing with it in a proactive way. So we're really lucky to have her. So without further ado, Rochelle Lando. Thank you. Thank you for that <laughs> wonderful introduction. I. Um, Got a little late with my um, PowerPoint, but I just wanted to give you a couple of quotes. Um, so one would be um, from Thich Nhat Han. He is a lot, um, definitely about mindfulness and he does walking meditation. He, he promotes a lot, of, even washing the dishes, he says we can do mindfully. Um, so he's basically saying the best way to take care of the future is to take care of the present moment. And another quote by John Kabat-Zinn, he developed mindfulness-based stress reduction um, and he's many books out there too. And his quote is mindfulness is paying attention on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally, or in other words, knowing what you are doing while you are doing it. So, and that's really the key, you know, we, we've already talked about today about really slowing slowing us down, really slowing down um, is really a key to mindfulness. And somebody mentioned even earlier about holding the breath. And it is a great indicator because the more stress we get, a lot of times the less we'll breathe. We won't be taking any deep breaths. So it's really actually a great sort of check-in of like where your breath is at um, to say, okay, whew, okay, I need to take some deep breaths to maybe get me grounded, get me more present in the moment. So I wanted just to do um, just a little mindfulness. Um, it's actually taken from John Kabat-Zinn. He, he uses a raisin, but I was hoping today people might have a snack near them or a drink. Um, and if they don't, Dr. Fish, I think one of our other um, presentations, he used uh, the monitor that everyone obviously has. So you can use any object, but for this, I was using our sense of taste. So if you can sort of get that together. And um, another quote from 
John Kabat-Zinn is when we taste with intention and attention, even the simplest foods provide a universe of sensory experience awakening us to them. So imagine that you do not know what this item is, because if you ever try to look at any, any words or anything, our brain, like Dr. Schwartz is saying, is on. Like, just as a challenge, try to look at something and our brain will try to read it. So we're just gonna imagine we're not even labeling this food item and we don't know what it is. So we're gonna be curious about it, sort of open up to our curious nature. And really it's so, just, you know, as you are carefully sort of looking at it, we're going to sort of slow down and I might go a little faster, really, sometimes people take a long time to sort of examine. So we're going to hold this food item if you in your hand, if you can, or just sort of have it. And we're going to sort of use all of our senses and let any distracting thoughts, we're going to sort of float away, sort of let them go. This is a moment for us. So we're going to look at the food item first and notice any interesting details about its appearance, you know, such as the color, the size, the texture, texture, the contours, maybe how it just feels against your skin, if you're able to hold it or touch it. And just keep imagining that you do not know what this food item is and you've never seen it before. And again, let your thoughts sort of float away. And just again, sort of being in touch with that color, size, texture, contours. And when you're ready, um, close your eyes and bring the food item close to your nose if you're able and caref carefully smell it. Noticing any of your body's reactions to the prolonged exposure to the food. Is it challenging to not just pop it in your mouth? Again, just noticing the sensation, the scent. And does it change from when you first smelled it to when you tried it before the next time? So if you're able, without chewing or swallowing the food item, place it in your mouth, noticing any flavor, textures, sensation, in your mouth, again, seeing if it changes over time as it's in your mouth. Observing your experiencing of it. Are you anticipating swallowing it, tasting it? Just noticing any body reactions to a food item. And when you're ready, make the decision to chew the item or swallow the item slowly as possible. And maybe we already did it without noticing, but just again, coming back, noticing, slowing it down, chewing slowly, paying attention to the sensory experience of eating, the movements, your jaw, the flavor of the food, maybe as it changes throughout the process. Just paying attention. And then make the decision to swallow the item if you were chewing, noticing it moving down your throat, noticing any body sensations, any taste, any lingering taste in the mouth. Again, observing any reactions of thoughts, feelings, body sensations, consuming this food item.
And as John Cabot Zinn said, there is in this moment only tasting. So when you're ready, you can come back. And so you can do this basically with anything. You can do like in the beginning, that first question, a body scan, you can start at your feet and then slowly do a body scan from your feet to your head or your head to your feet. But the key is really the slowness. And sometimes people, you know, are, especially with our staff and anyone, I think in society now, we want to get very fast. And sometimes it, and again, all of these things are a practice. They practice, practice, practice. We're not gonna get them when we first start. So um, just practice, that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Rochelle, um, for that really mindful activity. I know I got goosebumps a couple of times just doing it, um, which was nice. I feel much more relaxed now. Um, our last speaker today will be um, Scott Brown. Scott is a skilled professional in HR management and learning performance program leadership with over 15 years of experience providing HR leadership in the international development, civil infrastructure, and healthcare industry. Scott has extensive experience in all aspects of training, leadership, and execution, including strategic planning, program development, and management, as well as blended learning solutions. Scott is known for building valuable relationships and works with, well with people at all levels of an organization, including senior executives, management team members, and clients. So without further ado, since we're running behind, Scott, you have the floor. So I'm gonna talk about a burnout activity. What can we do that will have high impact, but a low commitment? And I'm going to propose a, an idea from the Duke University medical system that's called Three Good Things. But before we get into the details of that, Lewis, if you could pop up that slide. Could everyone just write in chat one thing this morning already that's already occurred one thing that you are grateful for that's already occurred today. And I think I would have to go with being able to have a snack during this meeting. <laughs> Coffee, I love it. Sunshine, oh, it's sunny. That's, it is nice out. Yeah, I just saw my neighbor outside. It was wonderful. Excellent. There we go. So thinking about what Dr. Schwartz said, what, what color do you think uh, thinking of this and remembering these things, what color does that make our amygdala? Is that a red amygdala or a green amygdala? What do we think, right? This is a, this is a green amygdala, amygdala um, activity <clears throat> that really helps us de-trigger uh, our parasitic, uh, excuse me, I said parasitic, <laughs> our nervous system. So, with that, with these thoughts in mind of things that we're grateful for, let's go back to the presentation because I want to show you a video. So thank you very much, Louis. Taking with us those thoughts about what we're grateful for and how thinking about what we're grateful for makes us feel. I would like to uh, just go to the next slide. I would like to talk about a program from Brian Sexton. He is from Duke Center for Healthcare uh, Safety and Quality at Duke uh, University Health System. And he has this great program that I want to uh, show a video of. If we could click on that video, it's gonna give a nice overview and then we'll come back and talk about it. Our question today is, what's the most popular of your well-being tools? I need a safe bet for my folks right now. Does that sound relevant? The short answer is three good things. Barbara Fredrickson says the negative screams at us, but the positive only whispers. You see, burnout and moral distress are about the impaired ability to experience positive emotion. There are 10 of these positive emotions, joy, gratitude, serenity, interest, hope, pride, amusement, awe, wonder, and inspiration and love. Now, when we are experiencing these positive emotions, it fills us with a sense of purpose and meaning. In fact, I dare you to feel a sense of purpose and meaning without going through one or more of those positive emotions. It's also through those positive emotions that we recharge our depleted batteries. 
So how do you make positive emotions more accessible when the negative ones are so prevalent? A simple intervention called three good things. Randomized clinical trials have shown that doing three good things every day for one week results in significantly elevated happiness and reduced depression. We found this to be interesting, and so we expanded this to healthcare workers and did it not for one week, but for two. Why? Because for one week of three good things, the effect size is slightly better than what you find for selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Prozac antidepressants. For two weeks, it's significantly better than SSRIs. In fact, we found for healthcare workers, not only did we increase happiness and reduce depression, but we also decreased burnout and decreased problems with work-life balance. We found over 15-day studies that by day 15, there was already significant reduction in those problems with work-life balance and burnout and depression. And also, these improvements were sustained for a year later. We've done this in multiple studies. So these are enduring effects. They don't just go away very briefly. Three Good Things is on demand. You can start at any time. You can use email or text formats. If you like it, you can share it with your colleagues. It takes about two to five minutes to enroll, about a minute or two each evening, and you're done after about 15 days or, or two weeks. So what's the take home message here? The negative is like Velcro. The positive is like Teflon, it just slides off. What Three Good Things does is it enhances your ability to see the positive that is there. It's scalable from individuals to work setting levels. For more resources and well being activities, check out our website and come back because we're always adding new evidence based tools and resources. As always, thank you for joining us today. Be well. Thank you. So just to recap, that might be just about two, two to five minutes to enroll. I've done this program. It's fantastic. It's super easy. Um, this is something that you could do yourself. We are in the month of November. We are literally two weeks out from Thanksgiving. So if you started today or tomorrow, you would actually be wrapping up this uh, activity of gratitude right as we roll into Thanksgiving. So then you can ask that answer that proverbial question at Thanksgiving and state things that you're grateful for. <laughs> so why, I think we've already talked about why, and this it obviously relates to more than just healthcare. So while that was a healthcare approach, this is a universal tool. You can do this for yourself. You can do this with a family member. Also, you can take this tool to your teams and have them do it also. It is an individual activity. So they'll be getting information on their own text, uh, cell phone, I mean. Uh, but nevertheless, it's private, it's confidential, it's not shared with the team at all, but it does help with burnout directly. I mean, the stats prove, uh, show, speak for themselves. So in addition to that, there are 18 free tools that are available from Brian Sexton's team at Duke University. Um, there's simple joys, which cultivates joy and playfulness. There's a, how to cultivate gratitude. There's a uh, Your Burnout Story, very interesting activity, and there's a Serenity uh, activity. So these tools are free to use. These tools are free to use. If you just Google up Duke Center for Healthcare or just Duke University Three Good Things, it'll pop up, uh, play around in there, and um, they'll send heads up right to your cell phone every night about seven o'clock, and you can just list out three things you're grateful for and move on with your day. Um, so were there any questions before we wrap things up about that tool? Scott, I have a question. Do you recommend this for kids? Like, do you, what age do you think kids can start doing this? Or is it a good family activity? It is definitely based on the cell phone. And um, I've never done this with minors before. It might be a great opportunity, but when you go through the registration process, there might be a, a, a limiting factor because it is actually an ongoing research study at Duke University. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. This is a great tool. I've done it myself and uh, I, I recommend commit to this, commit to, uh, commit to doing this in the next two weeks. I've decided to commit right now to doing it. I was thinking about it last night and I said, hey, why not? It's been about a year since I've done this. So thank you for having me and thank you for getting me to recommit to this program. Great, thank you for uh, that great presentation and that great resource. So before we head out today, um, we wanna ask two questions of the audience. 
And we'll do that using our uh, Mensimeter tool um, that we've been using. So I'll share the link in a second. This link will be different. And I'll throw that in the chat. And again, it'll be two questions, right? So we want to gather some data. Um, and the first question is really, are you feeling less anxious than when you stepped into our virtual room this morning, right? Give us your thoughts. Um, are you feeling less tension on your shoulders, right? Um, or do you feel more equipped um, to, to tackle stress and anxiety or burnout than when you did, when, than when you stepped in this morning, right? Um, because that's the whole point, right? We want um, to have resources. We want to share this really important knowledge. And we want to help you understand how your body, our bodies are functioning every single day. Great. You're learning things that you can actually do. Absolutely. That's, that's the whole point. Great. The second question is what topic would you like us to possibly cover in the future? We're always thinking about new and different things that we might be able to do. Um, so if you have any ideas, please share them again in the Mentimeter chat. And while you're all working on you know, sharing feedback with us, I just wanna take the time to thank all of our great speakers and panelists for taking the time to share um, their knowledge and expertise um, with us today. It really has been invaluable. And we hope that you'll come back and do some, some more in the future. Difficult conversation skills, okay. Conflict resolution in the workplace, yeah. Stress management, substance and alcohol abuse. Great, well, thank you everyone for, for taking the time to join us today. Um, that concludes our program. Again, thanks to all of our panelists and thank you all for, for you know, making the time and making the investment um, in wellness. We, we really appreciate it.